Thank you again, Josh, for taking the time to chat with us. And thank you for reminding us the importance of keeping our people at the center of our organization's growth. Next up, we have the keynote address by the amazing Rahaf Harfouche. Rahaf is a New York Times and USA Today bestseller, was a member of Barack Obama's digital media team during the 2008 presidential elections, she was the Associate Director of the Technology Pioneer Program at the World Economic Forum in Geneva and has been featured by Bloomberg, the CBC, CTV, and Forbes for her work on workplace culture. Today, she'll be delivering a keynote on knowledge work, technology, and the future of work. Take it away, Rahaf. Thank you, Yi, and thank you to everyone who's joining me at my first ever keynote session at Workplace Transform APAC. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today as the APAC region represents some of my favorite places in the world. Now, I know that your region has a diversified workforce and incredible richness of languages, races, and cultures. I've done client work in China, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and I'm counting down the days until I can return once it's safe to do so. And if I haven't mentioned your region, I can guarantee you that I have a folder on my computer compiling restaurants and itineraries for future trips. So please don't hesitate to email me if you've got a good place to eat, your favorite city to visit, or a site to see. Oh, and I love international dramas. So if you've got one that I have to watch, email me that too. I'm counting on us being able to be together in person very soon. But until then, let's talk about knowledge work, technology, and trying to predict the future. Humans have never been that great at predicting the future. I mean, think about it. People thought that by 2020, we'd have flying cars and colonies on the moon, and instead we're in the middle of a global pandemic and I have not gotten a haircut in like eight months. <laughs> and that's because for many of us, the future is this abstract concept, like one day we're gonna wake up and the future will have arrived. But that's just not how it works. I don't believe in worrying about the future. Instead, I think we need to focus on moving forwards towards possible future scenarios through our daily actions. And to do that, we have to understand the cultural, technological, and social context of our current behaviors. Now, this understanding is especially important as everyone is scrambling to figure out how to navigate this pandemic. Companies in every sector are under immense pressure to innovate, to pivot their business models, to implement new technologies, to introduce new policies, to figure out a way forward. And we have to do all of these things really fast. So today, I'm gonna to give you three questions to help us get through this very surreal period of time. First, I want to start by talking about digital social norms because they have become such a big part of our personal and our professional lives. We live in an information ecosystem that contains an infinite amount of information thanks to all of us. I mean, we produce a never-ending stream of data and content. Think about all the emails, the texts, the videos, the posts, and the photos that we create every single day. So it makes sense that many of us spend a lot of time trying to keep up with all of this information, both at home and at work. Things like friends news or colleague updates, industry happenings, current events, all the other research and information that is a regular part of working in a knowledge industry. And one of the ways that we try to manage this onslaught is to consume the information as it comes in via notifications. This has created the social norm where information is consumed nonstop throughout the day. And because we're constantly consuming and responding, we have a culture where we expect everyone to be reachable all the time. But from a technology usage perspective, what we're actually seeing is that in many cases, nonstop notifications are interrupting us, they're distracting us, and they're having an impact on our ability to concentrate and focus. And this is a big problem because in order to innovate, you need to be creative and creativity needs uninterrupted time and space. Here's why this matters. Organizations have to balance two equally important things. First, we have technologies that allow us to collaborate, to solve problems, to meet each other, and to organize projects, which are essential to innovation and a healthy company culture. We need these tools to stay connected and productive. 
But on the other hand, we also need to prioritize uninterrupted time so that our brains can come up with all of these great ideas and solutions. We also need time to think. So the first question I want you to think about is this. How can we use our technologies to better facilitate knowledge work? Or in other words, what do our people need in order to produce their best work? And how can our digital tools provide the right type of support? Now, the key here is to recognize that culture drives technology use and when applied strategically can help improve performance across the board. Some companies are experimenting with things like meeting free days in order to give people the chance to sit and focus on important strategic priorities. Teams should sit together and set clear expectations about response times for emails and chat messages and get specific on how each tool should be used. This is especially important if your team works across time zones or regions. For example, if you send a message to a colleague who's in a different time zone and it's after business hours for them, then everyone should understand that a response isn't expected until they're back at work the next day. Now for me, as a researcher and a writer, I need uninterrupted time in order to think. So from the onset, I let my clients know that I check my emails a few times a day and will usually get back to them within a few hours. I also encourage them to call me on the phone. Remember the phone if there's anything time sensitive or urgent. This sets clear expectations so they know I'm not going to answer instantly and it reduces miscommunication and frustration. And to executives, I am talking to you here. Do you expect instant responses from your team? Do you expect an answer within 30 minutes? Within an hour? How about a day? You would be surprised at how different each person's opinion of an acceptable time frame for responding to an email or a message can be. So ask your teams what their preferred response time is and then negotiate an agreement that everyone is clear about and everyone feels good about. Think about it this way. You have a financial strategy, a marketing strategy, a product strategy. Now you need to put into place a digital culture strategy. So to recap, the first question is about how you can use your technologies to help support knowledge work and keep teams connected. The second point I want to talk about is how our technology drives our culture. Now, the way we use technology isn't just determined by the company's culture, but by society's views on work as well. And we have a complicated relationship with work. We, as a society, have come to associate work with our identities, our status, and as a source of validation and self-worth. Much of our contemporary work culture comes from the American dream, this idea that if you just work hard enough, you'll definitely be successful. Now, I know we have an international audience watching, which is why I want to make this point. Even though the American dream started in America, the core of this idea has been exported all over the world because some of our biggest and most admired technology companies are American. And so globally, our standards of success have been influenced by these companies and by their culture. I mean, look no further than our modern day work heroes, the CEOs of successful companies. There's a common theme in how we talk about highly successful people in that we always focus on how much they work, how hard they work, how little sleep they get, or what time they get up in the morning. How many times have you read an article about a business person that you've admired that starts with, oh, CEO X gets up at 4.30 in the morning, works 23 hours a day, and manages to get everything done? But the problem is, is that the American dream also has a dark side, and I call this the shadow dream. Think about it this way. If you believe that if you work hard, you will be successful, then you also believe that if you're not successful, it must be because you're not working hard enough. And if you're not working hard enough, then you need to find a way to get more done. And there's no shortage of advice, tips, and tricks to help you jam even more into your day. The pandemic has only made this worse. Because if you're out of work or if you have less work than usual, you feel bad because we've internalized this idea that if you're not always busy, then it's your fault. You must not want to be successful badly enough. So we feel anxious when we're not busy because we think it means that we're not going to be deserving of our success. We've somehow grown to believe that any time that's not spent doing something productive is a waste. But if you're constantly doing then when are you thinking? 
These productivity ideals are constantly reinforced in the news, in magazines, on social media. But here's the thing. By telling people constantly how to do more, we've reinforced the idea that what we're all currently doing isn't enough. And in doing so, we've created a cultural narrative that celebrates overwork. And overwork kills creativity. You cannot be innovative if you're distracted, exhausted, or sleep deprived. And unfortunately, many executive teams are not getting this message. Leaders need to reassess how they define and measure high performance. In the world of knowledge work, the science is crystal clear. Sustained overwork leads to exhaustion and a decline in both quality and speed, period. So the second question I want you to think about is where in your organizational culture are you prioritizing rest and recovery? People whose jobs involve high cognitive tasks like researching or problem solving or strategizing or collaborating, they can't work nonstop for hours on end. They need regular periods of rest. And this type of behavior needs to be modeled from the top. Because if you don't lead by example, then no matter how many policies you put into place, it's not going to help. So are you sending messages at all hours of the day and night? Are you working on weekends and on holidays? Are you giving your teammates, your employees, the chance to really disconnect? Are you prioritizing activities and time spent away from work to recharge? Or does your team ever see you taking a break? Is recharging an encouraged activity in your office? All of these questions are meant to prompt a conversation so we can start to think about designing systems that are made for high-performing knowledge creatives and not continue to use ideologies that were borrowed from the industrial revolution that were never meant to be applied to the type of work we do today as knowledge workers. Here's a quick way to design some intentional recovery that you can put into place immediately. Take a meeting that's supposed to be an hour, reduce it to 45 minutes, and give people 15 minutes of thinking time at the end to process and reflect. Stop this whole idea of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings nonstop. It's a little hack that makes a big difference. And think about this, the only reason we even have one-hour meetings is because it's the default setting on our calendars. If you try it, you'll see that creating these little pockets of breathing time throughout your day will dramatically improve your focus and your output. So again, to recap, the second question is, how are you going to prioritize rest and recovery for your team? Now, all of this brings us to what's happening now. Disruption is the first step in a much larger process. And I know we've all heard how this pandemic has forced organizations to push forward in their digital transformation initiatives. But personally, I've never liked the word disruption or transformation because both of these words indicate a one-time change, like you've been disrupted or you've been transformed, and then that means that the work is done, that we can all go home. Instead, I'd like us to consider what I call an evolutionary mindset. An evolutionary mindset is one that accepts that continuous adaptation to changing market conditions is normal. This means fundamentally recognizing that we're never going to go back to an old normal. Just when we think things have calmed down, there is going to be a new thing, an event, a platform, a policy, something that's going to come along and change everything all over again. We need to embrace this reality of constant change. Which brings us to how we can start trying to plan for the future. To adopt an evolutionary mindset, I want to introduce you to an acronym I've created that's called FOPA, F-O-P-A. It stands for Future Oriented But Present Acting. FOPA means you're committed to building a better future through your consistent actions in the present, that you understand that your daily decisions will determine what future we live in. So if you want your company to continue to thrive in the future, to be adaptable and agile and innovative, you have to make sure that the actions that you're taking today, things like who you're hiring or how you're measuring performance or how you're supporting creativity or how you're encouraging rest and recovery, that all these things are being put into place right now in order to create the best possible conditions for knowledge workers to excel. 
we can't expect our teams to come up with innovative new solutions or to spot future opportunities or produce their best work if our current performance systems are working against them. And that's the big secret about predicting the future. You can't. You can only start with building a better present right now. So let me ask you, and this is the third question, are you willing to align your present culture with the desired future that you want to see? If you want to be a company that empowers knowledge workers, that can spot opportunities, that attracts the best and brightest thinkers, are you willing to put changes into your company culture today? Because I believe that disruption always creates opportunities. So how are we going to meet this present moment? The pandemic has pushed many people to work remotely and to adopt new technologies, but this is a great chance to experiment with new ways of working that are flexible and accessible. This is the perfect time to revisit your organizational culture. And there are changes that you can put into practice right now. The difficult part is that there are no one size fits all solutions here. So the best thing that you can do is to go and talk to your teams about what they need in order to produce their best work. We have to put the entire creative process, which includes thinking, doing, and resting at the center of our strategy, instead of just focusing all the time on the doing part. The doing isn't the entire process. We need to account for the thinking and the resting part of knowledge work as well. And don't be afraid to experiment. Not everything is going to work perfectly right out of the gate. I know, I have thrown a lot at you in the past 20 minutes, so I'll leave you with this. Many of the challenges that companies are facing in creating cultures that empower knowledge workers is in a way a crisis of imagination. We've just accepted the way things are because that's the way we've always done them. But that is no longer enough. To support high performers, you have to create systems that are designed for the type of work that they do. And we can't think up of new systems or new ways of working if we're too busy, if we're in back-to-back -back meetings, or if we're suffering from burnout. I want you to really think about this. I want you to ask yourself, how are you using technology to support the creative process in your company? How are you prioritizing rest and recovery? How are you actively designing for the future that you want through your daily decisions? Imagining a better future means creating the time to dream. It means doing less and thinking more. Your businesses depend on it. Our economic recovery depends on it. But I know that you're all up for the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Rahaf. You definitely got me thinking about the way I consume technology. I hope it's got all of your wheels turning as well. And don't forget to drop your questions in the comments below for Rahaf. And once again, thank you to Rahaf, Josh, and Vicky for taking the time to kick us off today. Now that we've set the stage with thought leaders, let's turn the conversation over to our customers. Each of the customers you'll hear from today have their own unique stories on how they've been supporting their employees' mental health and well being, encouraging authentic and transparent leadership as well as building culture even when apart. Without further ado, let's hear from Queensland Police Service, Scoot, and Olam, respectively. 